The climate crisis is accelerating faster than anyone expected. Do we really have time for a Green New Deal that tackles racism, homelessness, and our health system too? Author and activist Naomi Klein and I get into it on today's episode of The Laura Flanders Show, the show where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. This November, 11,000 scientists from 153 countries declared that, quote, we are reaching potentially irreversible climate tipping points, climate chain reactions that could cause significant disruptions to ecosystems, society, and economies, potentially making large areas of Earth uninhabitable. They released their statement on the 40th anniversary of the first World Climate Conference held back in 1979 in Geneva. That marks 40 years in which all sorts of people have seen what was coming, and 40 years in which governments have tried to respond without shifting their approach to things like deregulation, privatization, low taxation for the rich, and austerity for everyone else. It hasn't worked. And unless we shift to a very different kind of economy, pushing people to do more for the climate is only going to spark a bitter backlash as it already has. That's one of the lessons of California's historic wildfires, writes Naomi Klein in a new article just out from The Intercept. Naomi's latest book is On Fire, the burning case for the Green New Deal. Fire seems to be the topic, Naomi. Um, it's been a year since the campfire. You went back there. What did you find? I, I, spent, I spent a little time in, in paradise. Um, which of course was a community that was burned to the ground almost. I mean, there are a few structures that survived, but whole neighborhoods that were leveled. Um, and I also went to Chico, which is just a few minutes down the road. And that is the place where the vast majority of the people from Paradise uh, relocated. So it's a, a pretty small community of, was just under 100,000 people and suddenly had 20,000 new residents. So fifth bigger suddenly. Right. And so, I mean, I think one of the things, uh, you know, one of the things that's important to, re to remember is that, is that people in, from these communities behaved with incredible solidarity, incredible um, uh, ge generosity and the, a real spirit of mutual aid, uh, as so often happens, uh, uh, actually invariably happens after disasters, you know, whether it is Katrina or the Asian tsunami or Sandy. I mean, uh, we see, when, as humans, when we see our fellow humans suffering, um, we want to help. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we, and Chico showed this very, very powerfully. Um, but when you're on, what you also see is how difficult it is to maintain that spirit of I will fight for people I don't know. Um, when, you, when, when your public infrastructure is failing, when there wasn't enough affordable housing before, and now with those 20,000 additional people, uh, rents are skyrocketing. Uh, every, the cost of living is skyrocketing. Um, people are flipping their houses to turn a buck. Um, real estate speculation is happening all kinds of, you know, what I've called disaster capitalism is happening. And that, you know, when people are saying, wait a minute, some people are getting rich off of this um, and there aren't the mental health supports to deal with the PTSD. I mean, 86 people died. A lot of people I spoke with in Chico talked about how when they were breathing the smoke, um, they knew they were breathing in the remains of people. Mm. And that's just true. It was a crematorium, right? And so the trauma of that has really not been addressed. And so these are just some of the ways where we see that if we don't invest in the physical infrastructure and in the infrastructure of care that allows people to be their best selves in the long mm. haul, we aren't going to face these crises with the humanity that we need. But there are a lot of people, and you mention it in the book, who say, I got it. We understand. We have to deal with racism and homelessness and health care. But right now we have a pollution, environmental, recycling, you know, um, consumer problem. Um, let's just focus with that, right. with plastics or with the, the supply chain. Yeah, right. And, I, and, and frankly, I think that that is, has been the approach of the mainstream green movement for a long time. Um, sometimes said explicitly, sometimes sort of sotto voce, which is like, um, 
look, let's just save the planet first and then we'll deal with, you know, racism and inequality and gender exclusion and sort of just kind of wait your turn. And, and that doesn't go over very well because for people who are on the front lines of all of those other crises, they're all existential, right? I mean, if you can't feed your kids, if you're losing your house, if you're facing violence, all of it is existential. And so we, that we just have to accept that we live in a time of multiple overlapping, intersecting crises, and we have to figure out how to multitask, which means we need to figure out how to lower emissions in line with what scientists are telling us, which is really fast. And we need to do it in a way that builds a fair economy in the process, because if we don't, People are so overstressed and overburdened because of 40 years of neoliberal policy um, that when you introduce the kinds of sort of carbon-centric policies that try to pry this crisis apart from all the others, what that actually looks like is you're going to pay more for gas, you're going to pay more for electricity, we're just going to have a kind of market-based response. And so it's perceived as just one mm. more thing that is making life impossible. And the big boys will get away with get away with it because they have expensive lawyers, as they always do. Right. And 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 that that sense of injustice, I think, animated the yellow vest movement in France. And you know, that slogan: "You care about the end of the world. We care about the end of the month." Yeah. Right. Um, but you know, I've heard versions of that for years, where it's like, well, I can't, we can't deal with climate change because we have to, we have to put food on the table right now. We're in a crisis, right? And so, if we don't figure out yeah. a way to deal with climate change that doesn't ask people to choose <laughs> between the need to put food on the table, the need to care about the end of the month, and the need to safeguard the living systems on which all of life depends, we're going to lose. And give them some sense that they're living in a just society. Right. So and what that, is that sense doing? of inequality is really key, and it's an important lesson of history because if we look at um, you know, other moments when societies have changed very quickly, the, new, the original New Deal is one. Another one are the mobilizations during the Second World War where people um, you know, accepted rationing, accepted severe restrictions on the use of private vehicles because there was a limited amount of fuel. It was so central to those campaigns in the U.S. and in Britain that there be fairness, that yeah. you had to see, this isn't just regular working people who are being asked to change. Celebrities are having to change. Big corporations are having to change. And so, you know, fair shares for all mm. was one of the slogans. Um, share and share alike was another one. And we've never put justice at the center of our response to climate change at a governmental level. Of course, the environmental justice movement has been demanding this for decades, but our policies have never centered it. And I think that's a big part of the reason people reject it. So Chico did put at least affordable housing in their response. What did they actually do? No, but they, they, they weren't able to. And so w what's significant now is that on the anniversary of the, uh, of just on the eve of the anniversary of the campfire, um, a couple of members of Chico City Council unveiled a, a, their plan for a Green New Deal for Chico. Which included those. Which included affordable housing, which includes, as they put it, 21st century clean transportation, um, you know, which included food security, water security, right? Um, many of the themes that you've discussed over the years on this show, right? Um, and, and I think it is, it, it, it's, it's significant that this community that has been so much on the front lines of climate displacement because they have, they know what it means to absorb such a, you know, a huge new population that they said, this is the infrastructure that we need in the future that we have locked in, which isn't to say that we have locked in um, catastrophic levels of warming. If we, if we decarbonize our economies very, very quickly, um, you know, we can avoid those worst outcomes, or at least we hope we can. But, but what we know is that the future is rocky. Yeah. You know, the future has more of these types of disasters, more displacement. It, the future does mean that more people are going to be living on less land. So how are we going to live together on less land without turning on each other? That is a absolutely central debate we need to have because what we're actually seeing are a lot of politicians, including Donald Trump, but not just Trump, who are coming to power with their response, which is we're going to fortress our borders, we're going to create these scapegoats, we're going to hoard what's left, we're going to protect our own. You know, in the book I call this climate barbarism. Um, but I think the right is already, yeah. already has their response to, to the fact that we are entering this period, we're in this period of mass displacement. 
what's our response? So if Chico wasn't able to do it at the end of the day, have other cities been able to take that approach? Well, I wouldn't say that Chico hasn't been able to do it. I would say that Chico is straining <laughs> um, uh, under anybody inadequate anybody. infrastructure. And now they're putting forward a plan um, to be able to do this for in the long run. And it's going to be a fight. Um, and they know that they, can't, that, that, that they can't do it all locally, which is why we need a federal Green New Deal. But there have been initiatives level in Maine and yeah, Seattle yeah. and some other places. Are right. there places that you're excited about? I am. I mean, Seattle, look, I, I, after publishing this book, I've been you know, on the road for, for a couple of months now talking uh, with people who are trying to do this locally, yeah. you know, in cities like Austin, Seattle. Um, I did the, the, the book launch with a city councilor named uh, Teresa Mascada, who um, is part of this council that passed a resolution uh, calling for Seattle to have a Green New Deal with the boldest targets that we've ever seen from a city that already has a green reputation, but the significance of it is the extent to which they're not just centering justice, mm -hmm. but holding themselves accountable mm -hmm. to it. And this is what's very interesting about the Seattle example. In their Green Deal resolution that passed unanimously through council, they called for a, um, a board to be created that will hold them to their commitments. And on that board, are eight members of frontline communities, activists from communities, mostly communities of color, that have the dirty industries in their backyards, that are on the front lines of the impacts, as well as climate mm. scientists, as well as you know, more traditional green groups and trade unionists. Now that I've never seen, having that many activists holding their representatives accountable. So that's a model that I think we need to look at and say, okay, what, is that, what would that look like in New York? What would that look like in Washington, right? So. Where do we stand on the movement front? You mentioned Seattle, and I'm conscious that this is the 20th anniversary of yeah. the so-called Battle of Seattle, mm -hmm. uh, the massive uprising of um, environmentalists and activists and labor unions from all around the world, frankly. Yeah. And I went back and I actually looked at the, this is what democracy looks like, the amazing film mm -hmm. made by our friends, Big Noise Films. It was so international. It was mm -hmm. so multiracial, actually. Mm -hmm. The words that were used in the chants were life over product. Yeah. People over profits. Mm -hmm. Future, we want a future. They were saying that was 20 years ago. Yeah. If you were to compare where we were on this question of how we are connecting with each other in yeah. new ways, um, right. how are we? Doing? Okay, so that's interesting. <laughs> I mean, what, I think what you said is absolutely true, that that was a more internationalist moment for progressive movements than the moment that we're in, um, in that I think there was more infrastructure to support ongoing conversations across borders. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that trade unions were in that movement with both feet. I mean, the slogan, Teamsters and Turtles, together at last, right? So I think what was significant about the global justice movement um, that is very associated with Seattle, but there were a lot of these inflection points. I mean, was, preceding with Mexico and, Me yeah. and, and um, Paris, there'd been a lot before. Yes. The big difference, I would say, was that you had some large trade unions that were financing that infrastructure that allowed these tables to be created where people had those international conversations. And today? I don't think we have the anchor institutions that we need that are really investing in social movements so that we can have those um, Inter like even I don't even think we're doing it nationally, let alone internationally. So that's a, that's a big difference. You know, you said that it was multiracial. It wasn't. It wasn't multiracial enough, to be honest. Sure. Um, and and I think that that is a place I, where progress has been made. So I think we've lost some ground and we've gained some ground in terms of understanding the centrality of building a truly um, multiracial movement. I think interestingly that we saw on the platform a multiracial group of people talking, but the analysis of the role that white supremacy and slavery. No and incarceration were playing wasn't in integrated into the analysis. It wasn't a strong, it wasn't strong enough. We didn't have that as coherent analysis, um, you know, as informed by racial capitalism mm -hmm. and, and, and theorists like So this kind of, um, we've lost some, we've gained some, but going back to the question of sort of where are we, what, as great But I mean, Bob's but look at where say. we are yes. in this moment on the, with on the Chile, clock of the land. <laughs> you know, with uprisings in, in Chile and Lebanon and Hong Kong. Um, and, and so I think that it wouldn't, because there is, there, there, we are in a moment where things can tip very quickly because people have you know, been pushed so far to the edge um, that, it, that 
almost anything can act as a spark. I mean, we saw it in Puerto Rico with leak, you know, leaked leaked text messages. Um, you know, we saw have seen it in Haiti and Ecuador with you know the the loss of fuel subsidies in Chile with you know a, a sudden increase in public transit um, costs. It's just I think. I think the level of corruption is so intense, inequality is so outrageous, um, that you just never know mm. when that tip mm. is going to happen. And I think the lesson, and here's where I think we're in a better situation, and this is where you know the, the Green New Deal comes in, is that the, this moment of multiple uprisings, I think, shares a lot in common with 2009 and 10. Um, after the financial crisis, when you had the movement of the squares in Europe, you had the Arab Spring, then you had Occupy, right? And suddenly, all, you know, societies are tipping. Everybody's in the streets. But there isn't a clear demand of what the alternative to this failed model is. And I think that in the intervening years, so many people who are part of those movements have taken the responsibility of coming up with an alternative vision and an alternative plan really seriously. And so now, when we have one of those tipping moments, I don't think we are going to make the same mistake of like opening up a vacuum that somebody else can exploit, mm -hmm. right? Like the far right, mm -hmm. which is, you know, what, what, has, what has happened in too, many, in too many instances. And so that's why I think it is so exciting that you have movements that are not just oppositional, but Proposing. And you've been part of that, Molly Crabapple and Ale Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and your husband, Avi Lewis, and you put together an extraordinary message from the future video that got, well, an extraordinary response. Yeah, I mean, I think something like 10 million views, I, I, nothing like any of us had experienced before. Um, and that little film, I think it tapped into just the hunger that is out there to you know, believe that there is a future yeah. that is not this apocalypse that we are also blasé about its inevitability, right? You know, I mean, people making jokes all the time about, uh, oh, yeah, we're going to live in that zombie apocalypse. Yeah. You know, we'll all be eating each other's brains or each other's kids. I mean, it's just, it's become a cultural cliche that, that it, this is so inevitable. And so when you put something out there that says, okay, here's a vision of the future that isn't perfect because we are going to be dealing with, a worsening of the climate crisis because of the emissions we've already locked in. But what if we didn't turn into monsters? What if we invested in the infrastructure of care? And we told that story in that, in that, in that short little piece and the response we got you know, overwhelmed all of us. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet and that we had all the technology to do it. But people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. Ten years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create doubt and denial about climate change. It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing. And it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking like there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. 
Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. It took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 years left to cut our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything. How we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. The only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people and most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remembered that as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression, World War II. We knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The wave began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and then the Senate and the White House in 2020, and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the Federal Jobs Guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, the biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate, restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves with the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit Southern Florida, parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stopped being so scared of the future. We stop being scared of each other, and we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too, and in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, riding that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us. And the first big step was just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see. Final point, and let you go. We often end this program by asking our guests, like, what do they think the story is that the future will tell of now? But it goes back to the beginning in a sense that I think we talk about capitalism and alienation and extraction. Mm -hmm. You started with saying natural human instincts were kind of broken. 
by reality, by the, the condition of lives that we've made through our priority setting at the government yeah. level. In a sense, I'm hearing we need to reclaim our gut instincts about things. Well, I think what we need to do is figure out what are the policies that light up the best parts of ourselves? Yeah. Because we are complicated. We're all the things. Like, let's be real, you know? Like, we are, we are that person that rushes in to the disaster zone with everything we can carry and just wanting to help. And we are that person who just wants to hoard right, and protect our own. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and different policies light up different parts of ourselves. And when you have a society that in which economic precarity and competition are rampant, well, you light up the hoard yeah. um, and you suppress the share. Um, and there are policies that create a sort of a baseline level of security. And this is why it is so important that we are talking about Medicare for all. We are talking about everybody's right you know, to, to education at every level. You know, we are talking about the right to a living wage. We are talking about putting in policies that address that core insecurity that allow people to feel like they don't just have to hoard because we're going to be tested and we are already being tested and so we have to figure out like what kind of people are we going to be and what policies will help us be our best selves beautiful place to end you can get more information about Naomi's book and her book tour and her speaking gigs at our website Naomi Klein thank you so much thank you